Hi, I'm Father Chris Alar of the Marian Fathers here at the National Shrine of the Divine Mercy in Stockbridge, Massachusetts, and welcome to another episode of Living Divine Mercy. You know, as we approach November, a time in the church when we honor the faithful departed, we wanted to do a show on the saints. Now, who are the saints and why do we honor them? Well, the word saint in Latin is sanctus, which refers to someone who has been set apart to be holy. You know, every day in society, we look to people of honor, doctors, actors, athletes. And in fact, society worships these people many times more than we Catholics venerate our canonized saints because we don't worship them. They are simply good examples for us on how to become more like Christ. They show us that it's possible. You know, the church does not make or create saints, but rather only recognizes them. In 1 Corinthians 12, St. Paul says that we share in a common life and identity with Christ being members of his mystical body. Now, what is the mystical body of Christ? You hear the term often. It is those in heaven, the church triumphant, those on earth, the church militant, and those being purified in purgatory, the church suffering. But we are all spiritually united and connected and can even intercede for each other. So the saints help us to get to Jesus, not distract us from him. You know, we often hear that those who are not on earth are dead. Yes, they may be physically dead, but they are spiritually alive. And the Bible says, we know this, because the Bible says that our God is the God of the living, not the dead. And each of those groups I just mentioned is alive, just in different ways. Remember, Jesus spoke to Moses and Elijah on Mount Tabor. So even though they had died on this earth, they were not dead in eternity. And this has led the church to celebrate All Saints Day, which is a holy day of obligation coming up on November 1st and is connected to this doctrine of the communion of saints. You know, every day in the church, we honor canonized saints based on their feast days, like St. Faustina's October 5th. But what about everyone else in heaven? who is not officially canonized, they get their feast day too, as I said, on November 1st, All Saints Day. Now, we call that day All Hallows Day, which means a day for all the holy. And did you know that the night before that, the vigil of All Saints Day is also a holy day called All Hallows Eve. And we know that now as Halloween. Halloween means hallowed evening or holy evening. So, as Catholics, is it okay to celebrate Halloween? Well, join us next week as we'll discuss that topic. But until then, let us now join Father Dan Cambra, a Marian priest, as we discuss the saints. So, Father Dan, welcome. You knew we were going to drag you in for this show yes, because you are our saint expert. So tell us, how did you first get interested in the saints? You know, I can't even think of a time when I wasn't interested in saints. In my grandparents' homes and in my parents' homes, there's that gallery wall that everybody has with all the relatives. And in and amongst all the relatives, there's St. Anthony and, you know, St. Francis. And you're like, Mom, were they our relatives? Well, <laughs> I had two cousins, distant cousins, that I knew were Franciscans. So what would you say is our understanding or what a Catholic should understand a saint to be? Well, again, I, I look at my childhood and I was told saints are our heroes. Good they're, examples. They're the people that we're supposed to look up to, mm -hmm. we're supposed to follow their example, because their lives interpreted what they understood the gospel call to holiness was about. They basically heard the same gospel that you and I hear Sunday after Sunday, and they said, how does this apply to me? And the Latin for saint is sanctus, which means Set aside to be holy. Set aside to be holy, which every single baptized Catholic is called to do. And I shouldn't just say Catholic. It's every 
baptized Christian is called to be holy by that baptism into the life, death, and resurrection of Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me, as St. Paul would say. Very good. So we try to live a life that is as close as possible to Christ's life. But every one of us is unique with different gifts and talents, and every one of us is expected to interpret the gospel message in the way that suits our personality, our intelligence, and whatever gifts or talents we have. So, Father Dan, we always hear from non-Catholics that Jesus is the only mediator. And I always answer, yes, Jesus is the only way to the Father. He said that. But there's many ways to Jesus. So tell us a little bit about this mediation and why the saints can be that. And the whole idea of why do we have different mediators is precisely because all of the different saints put a different spin on how to follow Jesus. Some saints were teachers. Some saints were college professors. Some saints were religious women. Some people, some of the saints were people that lived an active life out in Fisherman. society. Fisherman. Fisherman. <laughs> Not the least of which. But, you know, it, it's important that we realize that sainthood is not limited to certain careers or professions. I remember as a child finding out that St. Clair of Assisi was the patron television. saint of television. television. And I was like, there is no way that she'd ever seen a television. And then I found out, yes, yeah, she had a miraculous experience where a hole in the wall of her cell opened up and she saw Right, because she couldn't make it to Mass, where if some of our viewers might know this, she uh, wanted to go to Mass, but she was unable to attend. So Jesus had it literally broadcast to her right on her wall. But Father Dan, what's the purpose of a relic, and what are the, some of the favorite ones you have? Well, one of the difficult issues with trying to explain to people the importance of relics is that nowadays we all take pictures every day with our phones, and before that, we had photographs of all sorts of significant people in our lives. And, but the truth of the matter is, photography is only about 150 years old. And before that, the only way that we would have a connection with somebody who had passed would be a relic. Yeah. You know, to get back to the idea, why do we yeah. have relics? Well. In the first couple of centuries of the church, we had the bones of martyrs. And goodness knows, many of the first century Christians were killed in all sorts of horrible, torturous ways. But even the earliest of the popes were very desirous of keeping the bones of the martyrs with reverence because they were the, the examples of Christian courage. They were the meek and the humble who inherited the eternal earth, which is in glory with God. Now that brings us to our last question and perhaps our most important, Father Dan, and that is, why do we Catholics pray to saints? You're worshiping them. If you weren't, you would go directly to God. All right. Now, I saw an interesting comment or um, story on Catholic Answers, and it says, you know, to pray doesn't mean to worship. It doesn't. It actually means to ask. And they use the example of the courts. Uh, the defendant prays that the court will be lenient. Well, that's not worshiping the court. It's asking the court. So an intercessory prayer is a very important part of our Catholic faith. But Father Dan, how do we answer those who say you're worshiping the saints if you're praying to them? Well, we, we ask other people to pray for All us the time. as well. Yeah. I mean, uh, I, I know you've asked me to pray for your parents. I've asked you to pray for my mother. Sometimes we bump into somebody and they say, how are you doing? And you say, well, it's kind of hard to get into all the details, but I would appreciate it if you would pray for me. A lot of times even non-Christians ask to pray. pray Absolutely. Yeah. I've, I've had many people who aren't Christian who have asked me to, to pray for them or to pray for some relative that's in the hospital. And 
I was like, I don't blame you for wanting covering all your bases. Who knows who's got the winning horse? So get in there and ask everybody to pray for you. <laughs> but when it comes to praying, uh, asking the saints to intercede for us, to pray for us, it is precisely in that same category. I ask lots of living people who I think are good people, but I don't know if they're really saints. And yet, on the other hand, I know that saints are more than just good people. There are people whose lives have been examined by the church, and they are considered an example of how to become one of the eternal saints in heaven. But I'd like to finish with one thing, and that is that famous, but these are dead people. You know, it's good to ask a living person, Father Chris, you're alive, you can pray for me, and Father Dan, you're alive, you can pray for me. But they always bring up, well, you can't talk to the dead. Well, I always, Father Dan, correct me if I'm wrong, but I always point to the transfiguration because who was Jesus conversing with in the, in the mountain was Moses and Elijah, who were two, quote unquote, dead people. Yep. But we know from the scriptures that he's God of the living. And so we know that as Jesus was talking to Moses and Elijah, uh, when we go into the next realm of our being, it's not being dead. It's being even more fully alive. More alive. Yeah. Because you might be good and I might have my good days, but the truth of the matter is we don't know who among the living who are going to pers persevere to the end. And we do know that the lives of the saints tell us they persevered to the end. And they would be the perfect people for us to say, pray for me. And that's the beauty of turning to a canonized saint, is you know that they have the authority of Christ, the church does, to declare that saint has made it to the finish line. What is it St. Paul tells us? It's like a big arena, yep. and we're all striving to get to that finish line, yep. and we know they did. Yes. Now that we've heard a little bit about the saints, let's hear from Scripture about how the Lord plans to prepare us for sanctification, which is becoming saints. From the book of Hebrews, Strive for peace with all men and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. The Meditation on the Passage Only holiness can enable us to enjoy the full light of God's presence in the next life. If we went to heaven still clutching our sins, even venial sins, our vision of God's goodness would be clouded and we would want to hide from his presence. But our Lord wants us to enjoy his love and glory forever. So he will do everything he can to prepare us. As St. Paul says, this is the will of God, your sanctification. St. Faustina assures us that Jesus is eager to help us reach sanctity she writes how very easy it is to become holy. All that is needed is a bit of goodwill. If Jesus sees this little bit of goodwill in the soul, he hurries to give himself to the soul, and nothing can stop him. Neither shortcomings nor falls, absolutely nothing. Jesus is anxious to help that soul and if it is faithful to this grace from God, it can very soon attain the highest holiness. God is very generous and does not deny his grace to anyone. Indeed, he gives more than what we ask of him. Faithfulness to the inspirations of the Holy Spirit, that is the shortest route. You know, the Lord sanctifies each of us in different ways. And one of the most special ways that he does it is as a suffering servant. Let's hear now a very touching and moving story about a little girl that our Lord asked to be a suffering servant. Courtney Lenneberg graced our world with her presence for 22 years. She was a beloved daughter and sister whose life was a constant witness to love amidst trials. 
Courtney was a beautiful burden. She was a total gift. The reason is, is because I look at her with an eternal perspective. I don't look at her as how the world looked at her. And so what was her job? Her job was to love, to give it, and to receive it. So she was born perfectly fine, but she had a seizure disorder. When she was five weeks old, uh, was the day of her baptism. She began to kind of shake and make an odd noise when she was being when she was actually being baptized. We ended up in the hospital, and she was diagnosed with a seizure disorder. She continued to have seizures. Uh, when she was seven months old, we agreed to give her a medication uh, to, that would hopefully stop the seizures. Unfortunately, what we didn't know was she was allergic to one of the ingredients in the medication. So not only did it not stop the seizures, but it made everything worse. She had a brain stem seizure. Uh, almost lost her life. By the grace of God, she survived, but she lost her sight, and she never surpassed seven to nine months in development after that. Mary and her husband spent the next several years consulting doctors, attempting to fix Courtney's medical problems with no success. When Courtney was seven, the Lennebergs went on a pilgrimage to Lourdes. So we show up in Lourdes, and we had done everything we could to be as open as we could to whatever God wanted. Courtney was the first to go into the water. They were preparing her to go in the water, and as they were doing that, they had a little statue of Our Lady, about six inches, and they were kind of touching it to different parts of her body, and Courtney swipes it. Courtney simply put it over her heart, and then her other hand she put on top, and she stayed there. She had a huge smile on her face. And so she goes into the water, she gives a good Irish yell because it was really cold, she comes back around and she's holding Our Lady in the same way, and she's just laughing. She's got this huge smile. And then it was my turn. I step into the water and the first thing they asked me was what was my prayer, you know, before they dunked me back in the water. And I couldn't think of anything because I was so cold and I was thinking about what Courtney did and I was so discombobulated, I just didn't know what was going on. So I took a deep breath and I closed my eyes and I heard a young woman's voice and it said the word acceptance, just acceptance. And I popped open my eyes because I thought one of the women had prayed that out loud. It wouldn't be until four years later that Mary discovered the significance of the word acceptance when Courtney underwent complex surgery. So she goes back into surgery, things go well, and as we're waiting, I read about what the Catholic Church teaches on healing, and they teach three things. Miraculous healing, healing after a time of suffering, and an acceptance that healing will not happen this side of heaven. And I started praying about it, and then I got it. Our prayer for our daughter, we had two prayers. One, that we would hear her authentic voice, the one God gave her, not the Chewbacca version that medicine gave her. And the second was that when he called her home, we would be with her, she would not be alone. And so what we realized that day was Courtney went in the water first. And it was the only time we were open in such a powerful way to what the Lord wanted to do. And we both heard a young woman's voice. And so we believe that that was our daughter telling us that she accepted her job, she knew what God wanted of her, and she agreed. And that she had a mission and a purpose, and it was our job to be her hands and feet. And so I kind of snuggle up to my daughter here in recovery, she's still unconscious. And I laughed and I said, Court, sweetheart, I said, I'm so sorry, mom and dad are so slow. <laughs> it only took us four years, honey, but we got it. I think we got it. And I said, it was you, wasn't it? It was you in the water. You knew, and you accepted everything that was happening. She opened her eyes, and she started laughing. <laughs> Devotion to Divine Mercy came later to the Lennebergs. In 2008, they were faced with the challenge of continuing Courtney's care while facing crippling debt. A family friend recommended that they write a letter asking for donations. I talked with my mom, and my mom said, you know, Mary, have you ever done a novena of divine mercy? And I said, Mom, divine mercy, you know, I believe in the mercy of God, but I didn't, I'd never heard of that novena. And so day nine comes and nothing, nothing happened. Like there's still no activity. And I thought, all right, Lord, then you're gonna, you're gonna provide a way. If that's what it is, you're gonna provide a way. And so the next day came, we woke up, day 10, of course the novena is done. And I get a call from the bank. Someone who had read the letter offered to match funds up to $40,000, but they only had a week to raise the money. Immediately, Mary started a blog. And I started writing about Courtney, and I started sharing our life. And within 
another novena cycle within nine days of that end of that novena. Not only was the second mortgage paid off, but we had enough funds to um, take care of her medical care for the next three years. So we call the Divine Mercy Novena Courtney's Novena. <gasps> so exciting. God does not make mistakes. Courtney was us inside out. So we spend our whole life hiding what is wrong, hiding what is broken, hiding what we don't want the world to see. She had no choice. It was all there. God gave us one job, to love. And if you look at the world right now, we're not doing a very good job of that. And so then he allows these special ones like Courtney to come into the world to show us, follow her lead. And so we did, because she continues to inspire people. She was the heart of our home. She was the face of Christ to us. Mary still clings to the message and devotion of Divine Mercy. She hopes that those who are touched by Courtney's story will do the same. It's changed our world. We walked through the door of Divine Mercy and we haven't looked back. Wow, what an incredible story about God's mercy in the midst of suffering. Now, if you remember in our first episode, we talked about Kim Marchese, who experienced the tragedy of loss of some of her family in an accident, but one of her sons became a Marian seminarian. Let's meet him right now. So what first drew me to discern the priesthood, I would say, was um, when I was a, about a freshman, maybe sophomore in high school, our local diocesan vocation director came into our school and he said, you know, Harrison, uh, a lot of people in this school recommended you make a great priest. And um, for me, that really struck me deeply and I felt that the Lord uh, definitely allowed that to touch my heart deeply. Um, and, and I would say that was the beginning uh, of the seeds of my vocation. I would say overall the first one, uh, devotion to Our Lady, the Immaculate Conception, and the spreading of making her known as the Immaculate Conception. I really believe, and I think most people here, or everybody here believes, uh, you know, that Mary's very important for one's vocation. And I really feel her with me and leading me and guiding me and bringing me to her son, but also taking me where the Lord wants me to go and who to serve. You know, of course, definitely through the sacrament of reconciliation, throughout the years, no matter where I've been in my life, the Lord's always been there for me in the, in the sacrament of reconciliation. Also too, just on a, a general level of I think people often tend, and I've seen this in myself, to see God as kind of more of a, a harsh God or a judging God and, and trying to live up to his expectations. But I really have seen the Lord tell me over and over in my life that uh, he's gentle and he's loving and he's merciful. And so it really has helped me even in that, to become more merciful with myself. And, and the fruit of that as well, I think, is being merciful with others. We mentioned earlier that coming up soon is November 1st, All Saints Day. Let us all now get a blessing from Father Kendo Santos regarding this day. On behalf of all the Marians of the Immaculate Conception, we offer this prayer and blessing for the solemnity of all saints. Almighty ever-living God, by whose solemn gift we venerate the merits of all the saints, bestow upon us through their intercession a spirit of reconciliation with you. Purify our hearts of all sin, that we might be truly open to the grace of the Holy Spirit, that with the help of all the saints, 
and through the light of Christ, we might foster a new springtime, faithful to the teachings and traditions of the church, and resplendent with the example of those who have gone before us, marked with the sign of faith, they who followed always the example of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever, amen. Through the intercession of all the saints, may the blessing of Almighty God, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit come down upon you and remain with you forever, amen. Now let's hear more about the importance of the saints as told to us by St. Faustina in her diary. I rejoiced greatly at the fact of how much the saints think of us and how closely we are united with them. Oh, the goodness of God! How beautiful is the spiritual world that already here on earth we commune with the saints. Once, when I was praying fervently, I suddenly saw my guardian angel who led me before the throne of God. I passed through great hosts of saints, and I recognized many of them whom I knew from their pictures. Now I understand why there are so few saints. It is because so few souls are deeply humble. So thank you again for joining us for this episode of Living Divine Mercy, and join us next week as we talk about Halloween and should Catholics celebrate it or not. Until then, keep turning to God's mercy, his most important attribute. And may he bless you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.